Hi, welcome back to 101 Things. This time we're going to build a planetarium with a Pi Pico and a cheap TFT display. The hardware is really simple to build and it displays a real-time map of the night sky. It shows stars, planets, deep sky objects and the moon and sun. I'm using the Wi-Fi capability of the Pico 2W to update the time from an NTP server. Let's start by looking at the hardware then take a look at how the software works. If you want to build this project yourself, or if you just want to find out more about the technical details, there are links in the description to the code and the documentation. In most of my projects so far, I've been using the ILI 9341 displays. But this project really benefits from a larger ST7796 display. I'm using a 4 inch display with a resolution of 480 by 320. I'm using a full size frame buffer for the display, which needs 300 kilobytes of RAM. This is too big to fit in a Pico 1, but it fits in the Pico 2 without any issues. I'm also using NTP to update the time over Wi-Fi, so the Pico 2W is the preferred platform. If you're happy with a smaller display, or you don't need the Wi-Fi, you can disable these at compile time. There's a lot of variation in these cheap TFT displays, so if you have issues with the orientation or the colour, you might need to change one of these settings in the sketch. The core software is written in pure C++, it can even be built on a PC. That's how I made some of the clips in this video. The hardware specific aspects, like the display driver, have been optimised for the Pi Pico. I'm using the Arduino Pico core by Earl Philhauer. It's a really easy way to set up a development environment for the Pi Pico. It only takes a few minutes to get up and running. One of the awkward things about using Wi-Fi is managing credentials. I'm using Wi-Fi Manager Pico by Matt Thorley. It's lightweight and easy to configure. I've made a couple of minor customizations to remove dependencies and allow shared access to the E-squared prom. The foundation of the software is plotting the star field. I'm using the Yale Bright Star Catalog as the basis. It has about 10,000 stars which makes it a good fit for the flash storage and covers nearly all the stars visible to the naked eye. The catalogue includes the right ascension and declination of each star and also includes the magnitude and spectral class. I pre-process the data into Cartesian XYZ coordinates before storing it in flash. This avoids using trig functions during rendering which gives a massive boost to performance. I've defined the x, y and z axis to make it easier to translate to screen coordinates later on. Imagine looking up through the screen at the sky. I can scale the x and y coordinates to fit on the screen. I only need to plot stars with a positive z value, the rest will be behind us. If we were at the North Pole, looking straight up at the right time, we'd be there already. For other locations at other times, we need to rotate the celestial sphere so that we're looking at the right part of the sky. This needs four rotations around the z and x axis. The first rotation adjusts for the rotation of the Earth. The Earth rotates every 23 hours, 56 minutes and 4 seconds, and the stars appear to rotate in the opposite direction. To adjust for this, we rotate around the z axis by the local sidereal time. We can work out the local sidereal time from the UTC time and the observer's longitude. The second rotation adjusts for the observer's latitude. At the North Pole, the Celestial Pole, appears directly overhead. As we move south, it appears lower in the sky and reaches the horizon at the equator. To simulate this, we rotate the celestial sphere around the x-axis. The third rotation depends on the azimuth of the observer's view. That's the compass direction, north, south, east or west, that we're looking in. We rotate around the x-axis by the azimuth. The fourth rotation depends on the elevation of the observer's view. If we're looking straight up, the altitude's 90 degrees. If we're looking at the horizon, it's zero. We rotate around the x-axis by 90 degrees minus the altitude. Each of the four rotations is represented as a 3 by 3 matrix and we can multiply the four matrices together to form a single transformation matrix. Although we need to use trig functions to calculate the matrix, we only need to do this once for each time and location. We can then transform each star using nine multiplies and six adds. 
This saves a lot of time over a 10,000 stars. I used the magnitude and spectral class information from the Bright Star Catalog to vary the size, brightness and colour of each star on the display. Constellations are overlaid using line segments between the brightest stars in each group. These are stored as coordinate pairs in flash and undergo the same transformation as the stars. The names and the centre points of each constellation are also stored in flash and are used to label the star map. Deep sky objects are plotted in a similar way. I've used a curated list of the most popular Messier and NGC objects from Eleanor Lutz's Python Star Atlas project. I've added links to this project and to the source data in the documentation. It's well worth a look. The planets move across the night sky as they orbit the sun. The orbits of the planets can be calculated using Kepler's equation. We need some parameters to describe the orbit of each planet. These tell us the size, shape and orientation of an ellipse relative to the Sun. We also need to know the length of a planet's year or a related parameter. I generated this animation using a Python script. It doesn't include all the orbital parameters, but it does give an idea of how the process works. I found Greg Miller's Celestial Programming site to be a very useful resource. I adapted the approach from one of his tutorials to this project. There's more detail and links to the tutorial in the documentation. The final touch is to calculate the position of the Moon and the Sun. We can work out the Sun's position from the orbital data for the Earth. I followed another of Greg Miller's tutorials to calculate the position of the Moon. Again, I've included details and links in the documentation. OK, so that wraps it up for the software. The only thing left is to put the project in an enclosure. I've designed this simple 3D printed enclosure in FreeCAD. There's a link to the design files and the STL files in the description. OK, so there it is, the finished project. I've had quite a lot of fun with this one and I've learned quite a lot along the way. In the future, I'd like to experiment with adding GPS and IMU sensors to update the view in real time. I think it could be a useful tool to help navigate the night sky. I've got a lot more ideas for projects like this one, so if you'd like to see more, why not subscribe? I hope you've enjoyed the video, thanks very much for watching, and I'll see you next time.